Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvelously well. I'm sitting here with the rather wonderful uh, Jason LaRocca. How are you? I'm great, Warren. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. What happened to your arm? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Skateboarding with my son. That's cool. I guess if I'm going to have a story, that's probably the coolest one I can tell. Yeah. Mixing left-handed. And, oh, wow. Uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge. I got My assistant got me a, a, a trackpad. And I'm, and I, cause I can do, I can do the trackpad with my left hand really fast. I, do you play I, guitar or piano? I play guitar right-handed. So yeah, that's my strumming arm. I, I mean, it happened two days ago, so it's pretty fresh, oh. but, uh, <laughs> but I can move, I mean, I can move my fingers and stuff, you know, and I can move my, you know, the rest of my arm is fine. Well, you're looking great. Last time I saw you was, wow, it was two years ago with, apart from obviously the, uh, the sporting injury. Are you still there at the fab factory? I'm still here at Fab. I'm I'm actually uh, alone here at the moment. Uh, Pensado, wow. Pensado's mixing at home. McKelly's mixing at home, and uh, so it's it's been a bit lonely. I have my assistant here, or he comes in and out. Been a bit of a different dynamic since the pandemic started, but uh, I am still here. I mean, I, I went home for a month straight when it happened because you know they closed everything down and, and no one was allowed anywhere. But once we were allowed to um go back in i had i had just been chomping at the bit to come back because i had to mix stuff and surround and i i didn't take all the stuff home with me i just took my my computer and my uh avid console that was it so oh you took the avid console home though yeah i mean i just have a you know i have an s3 that i took with me so yeah it wasn't great wasn't taking up a lot of real estate and once i was able to come back in here i was eager i suppose you know it's social isolation if you're the only one there and they're all at their homes i mean you can't get more socially isolated than that can you yeah i mean <laughs> what you and i are doing on this laptop is how i've basically been mixing with all of my clients since the pandemic started so i've i've been here in the studio but they no, no, no one's been coming here i just i get up on on zoom and then i send them have you used audio movers yes so I've been using audio movers and Zoom, and it's been working fabulously. That's fantastic. But did you find most of what we do is like that anyway? I mean, for me, I've had a couple of clients come, come in. I did a video the other day where I had to record some drums, and the drummer just kind of comes in, goes into the drum room. He's wearing a face mask. He performs, and then he leaves. Most of my other work, or a good portion of it, it's mixing, and mixing is 99% on my own anyway. Mm -hmm. Which is Eric and I. I think for a lot of us, it hasn't changed as dramatically as it had for obviously other people in other industries. Yeah, I mean, certainly the recording side of it, as you say, is is definitely become more difficult because it's it's made certain restrictions on on what you can do uh, a little bit more cumbersome. You know, the fact that you have to have everyone six feet apart, you know, limits how many people you can have in a given room, and uh, also vastly you know lengthens the time it takes to get things done uh and so that side of it has changed quite a bit and as a result some of the mixing has changed just because we have right more tracks and things like that because there's a lot more people recording individually as opposed to recording every like like a choir for instance i've done several choir sessions and rather than just record a bunch of people in a room which we can't do we did one session where we had everyone record individually at home and then send us 64 audio tracks. Wow. How was that? <laughs> the pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I had an engineer put it all together, line it all up, yep. and clean it all up, and call some of the singers back to re-record things that were distorted or not quite right. And, and before I even touch it, there's a whole back and forth between another engineer who just basically is, is qualifying everything to make sure it's right and then gives it to me. So the process takes a lot longer, whereas, you know, we could just get in a room, record a choir in three hours and be done with it. How was the results in the end? We'd like to think that it's actually producing some, some favorable results in weird ways. Like the fact that... That's what we, I wondered. Yeah. I, I mean, having all these people record individually is very strange on the recording side, but on the mixing side actually was exactly what the client actually really liked it. He liked that everybody was really close up with a, with a spot mic right on him, which we wouldn't have had if we recorded 64 singers as a choir. It would have been much further back. So 
he really liked it. And then I had done a, a session for um, Hans Zimmer a couple of weeks ago where we were recording choir four singers at a time. We had to record them singing a lead line, two different harmony lines, and a choral part. And each set of four singers had to do all of that. So by the time we were done with tracking and layering as much as we needed to, we had over a thousand tracks of audio for all the choir parts. Wow. That sounded really good. <laughs> it was great too, because um, we were able to get the harmonies within the four singers live. And then we, yep. were, we were just stacking those. So rather than take one, mm. one choral ha- harmony and then stack it later, we were actually doing those harmonies live with, the f- with those four singers. They were able to hear each other and tune to each other as they were going down. And then it was just a matter of layering certain things. So you, we definitely had that perfect balance of getting that live feeling of pit, you know, tuning to each other, but then also hearing your previous recordings to tune to that. And once we had it all layered, I mean, these guys were, they're so friggin' good. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I mean, you could throw anything at these session singers, as you know, and and they're just, you know, this stuff is, is no big deal to them. And, uh, they, they did great with it. What was it for? So Hans Zimmer, is it for a new movie coming out or a TV show? We're, uh, we're not allowed to say what it's for, but, um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Hans thing. (laughs) Where did you record it? Uh, we recorded it at Remote Control at his studio. Oh, fantastic! Yeah. What yeah. sort of what sort of facilities does he have? I can imagine it's pretty mind blowing. They have a lot of writing rooms, and uh, you know, rooms kind of like this size in my room here. A lot of writing rooms like this, but then they have a few uh, live rooms where they can do some tracking. So the the main room that they have is uh, Studio B. I believe they call it. And that's the, their main live room, which is about, you know, 25 by 20 or something like that. Uh, live room where they do, you know, whatever overdubs drums and, and vocals and cellos and quartets and things like that. So six feet apart, we were able to fit exactly four singers if they, if they were, you know, basically six feet apart with gobos in there. So, uh, I guess that makes the room a little bit wider than that. So it's 30 some odd feet or whatever that is. And it worked out great. Um, But they, they have mostly writing rooms, not a, not a lot of tracking rooms and that I'm aware of. That's the main one they have. And uh, it's a, it's a great sounding room, obviously. Yeah. Is he doing string dates and stuff in there as well? Or are you going to other rooms? I don't know what they're doing. Um, I've, I've been seeing Alan Meyerson post some stuff about uh, recording at Fox. So um, nice. Maybe they were, I, I don't know if that's for Hans or who, but uh, Fox is recording stuff right now. So great. You know, there is, there is some life back in LA recording, which is great to see, you know. We were able to do a session at sunset. Same thing. Every member of staff was wearing masks. If you weren't singing, you had a mask on and they were cleaning everything as you went. Like everybody touched something and then wipe it clean. If we're able to sort of, mostly focus on the creative side of it and and actually yep. get get a result at the end of the day then we we've done the best we could because you know this isn't going away we obviously have to keep going with what we're doing and do it as safely as possible so i think everybody what they're doing to to you know mitigate it and 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 make it as safe as possible for everybody who is having to go out and record and make it so that we can actually get back to work i think it's it's uh it's great because we we miss it obviously and uh it's it's uh, slowly but surely coming back so you you just won an emmy <laughs> what did you win an emmy for <laughs> we'll see i think the they're gonna actually announce everything in september do you know that you've won do they tell you in advance <laughs> if they did they didn't tell me <laughs> <laughs> so you're officially nominated so what were you what were you officially nominated for the, the composers for the show little fire yep. everywhere got nominated uh, beautiful score so that was mark isham and Isa summers who is uh famously known as as the machine from florence and the machine mark isham's name i obviously re- uh, recognize it has a lot of credits yes yeah, Mark is deeply rooted in in the film and television scoring world. It is as this is her foray into into scoring. So this is her I mean, this is her first show that she's done, uh, teaming yep. up with Mark. So her first show gets her her first Emmy nomination. So not not too bad. <laughs> so they got nominated. The uh, 
the song Build It Up by Ingrid Michaelson also got nominated. I'm not sure what the category is for that. I think it's original song and lyrics. I recorded a bunch of stuff and, and mixed that as well. Give us a little bit of synopsis about what you've been doing over the last couple of years. We have a film that we just wrapped up that's coming out, I think, September 1st. It got moved. It was uh, It's the Bill and Ted 3. Bill and oh, Ted fantastic. Ted. <laughs> I'd uh, read about that. I didn't know you were working on that. Yeah, yeah. So um, we just basically just finished that. We were going to record that here in Los Angeles, but we weren't able to because of the lockdown. So we um, recorded remotely with, with uh, Eastern Europe, but uh, it all came out really well, mixed it here and, and mixed it under the lockdown conditions. And like you said, it hasn't really changed uh, too much in terms of my workflow. In some ways, I think some of it's actually gotten a little more streamlined. I didn't know about audio movers until the lockdown. Uh, because of the lockdown, somebody had told me about it. I know a lot of people have been using it, you know, since before. I've been using it pretty much on a daily basis with clients uh, since then. And it's, uh, that has improved for me and has happened sort of as a result of not really being able to have people here in person at the studio. So that was great. We finished that and, and, and we did the show, uh, which we were just talking about, uh, Little Fires Everywhere, which we did in the earlier part of the year. Actually, right, we just had finished it actually right before... Um, the lockdown was announced in, in California. So uh, luckily we had just finished recording and uh, that was an eight episode mini series, uh, which just got nominated for, I think five or six uh, Emmys, uh, two of them being music. Uh, the Congratulations. Score. Yeah, thank you. The score and, uh, and a song, a featured song, which uh, was, were all mixed here. And that show was really great working with, with, uh, Isa and working with Mark. I mean, with Mark, I have a long history and we can, I could tell you about, he's basically the, the reason I am in the film and TV world. Cause he, oh, I didn't know that. Give me a little bit of history on that. Yeah. It was basically in the late nineties, I was, you know, in bands and we were playing around Los Angeles in the local scene. A friend of mine from another band uh, who we became friends with was, was, uh, was Mark Isham's assistant and was was leaving his job there as his assistant to go on to do other things and and was just asking around you know various people that he knew who were budding professionals and wanting to get into the studio world if they would want to go meet him and see if if it might uh, be a gig and i knew nothing about the film and tv world i, I really didn't and uh, i was you know i was into rock and roll and punk rock and stuff so i was I was just kind of doing my thing in the band world. I was really wanting to get into the studio world and in some, I just fully immersed myself in music. And so I thought, wow, what a crazy opportunity. Like, you know, who knows where this will go. And so that's when I met him. And I, and that was really kind of uh, jaw dropping because I, I sort of got to learn all about his credits and things like that. And once I got an understanding of who he was, I was like, Oh my gosh, this guy is like, massive film composer like <laughs> don't stand a chance working for this guy so uh you know i just kind of told him about who i was which is really that i'm a really diy kind of person and uh you know i don't come from formal training as an engineer or as a producer or as a musician or songwriter i just i've always been really really uh really in love with music as an art form from an early age and have just taken it upon myself to learn in any way that I can on my own. And he appreciated that. And he was he was interviewing all these, you know, sort of Juilliard grads and things like that, who all had this formal, you know, <laughs> position training, stuff like that, that, you know, I said, listen, I'm not that guy. And so if that's what you want, I, I, I'm, I know I'm not going to, I'm not going to be right for you, but I have my own home studio. I used to own a Tascam Porta Studio 4 and I've upgraded myself to an E16 Fostex tape machine. I, I know how to align tape machines. I have my own Mackie 2408 console. Like, you know, this was the early, <laughs> was, you know, Pro Tools didn't even have like the, the Digio one hadn't even come out yet. Like this was the only, if you were going to have a home studio, that was sure. just, that was as close as you can get to, you know. Or ADATs. ADATs. I, I had ADATs. Yeah, 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 exactly. I couldn't afford the ADATs, so I got the E16. He thought, well, okay, well, it was really great to meet you. You know, we, we shook hands and I said, I said, would be great if you would just consider letting me intern and just 
come in every day and just help you just do whatever you need help with. And he said, all right, well, I'll let you know. So he called me the next day and he said, you should, you should come over. You should start, you should start interning. I, I think that's a good idea. So, so I did. So I just, I, you know, I basically just worked, worked my butt off doing whatever he asked for from making coffees to, you know, learning how to make, you know, lattes to whatever it was. And I did that for about two and a half weeks. And he said, yeah, well, why don't you stay? You know, why don't you uh, learn the ropes around here? So I figured out uh, how to become an assistant, which at the time, a lot of that had to do with, uh, you know, uh, Roland S760 sample libraries and all the old, you know, 32 megabyte samplers, you know, the S1000s, you know, all the Akai oh. samplers and stuff like that. So it took about two and a half hours to load up his sample libraries into the Akai's and the Roland's. I knew nothing about this stuff. I mean, I really just, I knew nothing about all this stuff. So I had to really hunker down and stay after, after work and, and spend hours learning about SCSI and IDs and, you know, hard drive IDs and things like that so that I just wouldn't mess up, you know, because I had so much to learn. And that's really what I did. He had just bought a uh, CS3000 Euphonics console, which at the time was the newest cutting edge, you know, digitally controlled analog console that you could get. And nobody knew how to use it. So I said, hey, listen, I'll study the manual. I'll get really good at this. I promise. And he's like, well, my engineer can't even figure it out. So I doubt you'll be able to. So good luck. And uh, I spent about three weeks just figuring out how to patch on the patch bay with it and use it. And I eventually was able to do some things that the engineer couldn't and then became useful. And that kind of got me, you know, little, little notches further into the doorway of, of becoming more and more valuable to, to Mark. And then later on to, to other people as well. But that was, that was kind of how I became introduced to the whole film and TV world, just kind of really by happenstance. You know, I just didn't, it was never a planned thing. It was not like, Oh, I love, I love this world. I'd like to, you know, deeply immerse myself in it. I didn't know anything about it, but once, once I got to really understand what was going on and the complexity of how it all gets put together and what goes into making a film score and, you know, working in surround sound and all that stuff, it was, it was just incredible, you know, and I really just kind of didn't look back, I guess, at that point, but I was, I was still in bands and, and making music. So it was, um, kind of funny i i eventually uh, one of my bands got signed to a punk label in la called side one dummy records and oh, i remember side one dummy yeah <laughs> and so we ended up getting on a bunch of tours with their bands so like we we ended up playing with uh touring with flog and molly and dropkick murphys and anti-flag and uh the mighty mighty boss tones and i mean just everybody who we were just really in love with and looked up to as, as uh, our idols, you know, in the punk world, we were now getting to tour with. And so eventually I said, well, this is, this is an interesting thing. Now I think I'm going to have to just dedicate myself fully to this. So while I had been working in the studio in the film and TV world as an assistant for Mark Isham, this was starting to happen. And I said, well, you know, I think this is really kind of exciting and, and special. I think I should go do this. And he said, cool, man, do your thing. And so I had left um, my assistant job with him in 2004 uh, to go tour full-time in a van. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So what was the name of your band? It was called The Briggs. And, oh, The Briggs. Uh, How long did you take off to go back and live the dream and be in the band? Well, it was, it was, it was weird. I basically had sort of two two career paths starting to happen at the same time. So I was, I was touring and I was doing that. But as you know, with touring, it's like you're, you're home for a month, you're home for a month and a half, you're home for whatever. And there's a lot of downtime too. So I was, um, you know, I was trying to make myself busy with things at home when I was, when I was not on tour and, and started to just see if I could go freelance and see where that would take me as an engineer and as a producer. So I ended up, getting back into some of the film and TV worlds, um, starting with Mark. And I called him and I said, you know, uh, what would you think about having me mix some things for you and, and let me know if you, if you ever need anything. And, and uh, I've, I've got my mixing chops going and I'm getting pretty good at it. And he said, well, 
Um, you know, I always did like you, so I'll see what I can find. And I little by little got, you know, a couple little gigs here and there doing like a little TV show or a little, you know, commercial or something like that. And, um, really just stuff that would kind of keep me busy while I was home. It wasn't really anything major, but for the most part between 2004 and 2009, I, I, I was almost completely completely dedicated to the band and just just on tour the whole time so we you know we were making records and and i got to work with like paul coldry you know, this was all from from being in the band you know but but i was always really interested in what was going on and really really just so so intent on on knowing everything i could about what was going on technically and from the producer standpoint so I got to learn from those guys and, and, you know, we had a great run of touring and making records and things like that. But it, eventually I just sort of saw the writing on the wall that it was just not, it wasn't going to last very long for me. Do you think there was also a little bit of a writing on the wall with the guitar band kind of touring? Well, yeah. Yeah. Did for sure. Play into it. I was like, you know, I, I don't, cause I was starting to get into, you know, not necessarily EDM. It wasn't really EDM yet, but you know, some electronic stuff that was really cool. Um, you know, like Autechre and, and Aphex Twin and stuff like that, that I thought was really, really great pushing the envelope and things that, that were also kind of engineer driven type artistry, you know, or like a lot of, sure. a lot of edits and, and really interesting recording and manipulation techniques and, and stuff like that, that I thought, yeah, where does, where does pl- being a guitar player have a, a, a place in all this in, in the f- future of, of music as a performer? So uh, I definitely thought about that too, but there's really, there's really nothing that compares to being a performer. And I, it was really hard for me to kind of turn that down. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Cause it was, it was also how I was, I was making a living. So sort of just deciding I wasn't going to do it anymore and just focus being a freelance engineer as you know, in the early stages of freelance engineers, you're either, you got a gig and you're okay, or you got nothing and you're borrowing food from your parents. And I did that, <laughs> yes. I did that for a while. And it was, it, it was scary. I definitely thought, man, I think maybe I should just, I should just get a regular job because this is really not, I don't know if the, I'm even going to be able to survive this, but you know, just uh, enough gigs came along that kept me motivated to, to know that, you know, there is something here, this could become something and let's just see what happens. And, you know, through the thick and thin of it, I just kind of buckled down and said, cool, I'm just going to go for this. And, and, uh, you know, really just really purely focused in 2009, I just purely focused on, on just being a freelance engineer producer and started to build up a, you know, some, some clientele, uh, with various composers and producers and got like, I was working with on CSI Miami was like one of the first shows I started mixing for and stuff. And from there I would just meet different people and, and, and get my sort of foot in various doors and, you know, a lot of it by the seat of my pants too, you know, like, you know, learning, learning, learning pro tools from learning pro tools to learning how to record an orchestra and things like that were, you know, a lot of these things were just sort of like, well, Hey, you want to do this gig? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. (laughs) And I would figure it out. You know what I mean? And luckily the results have always, you know, turned out in my favor. So what's going through my mind as you're talking about this, first of all, it was great to hear, um, Paul Q. Cordley's name again. There was a period in the mid '90s where, if I saw him and Sean Slade's name on a record, I wanted to hear it. Oh, he's he's I think one of the greats. Honestly, when when yeah. when I found out we were going to work with him, I was already a fan of his. You know, because great, no one else in the band really paid attention to credits like that. You know, who was engineering? Sure. But but one of the records I really freaking loved was was the whole uh, Live Through This record, with, which Paul did, which is just I mean, you talk about perfect balance of raw and pop and lo-fi and hi-fi. I mean, that record is a freaking perfect example of that, where it is it is so raw and punk rock, but so melodic and well-produced. Mm-hmm. I mean, that that energy is is like infectious. When you listen to that record, it's it's great. And the drum sounds are incredible. Like the the you hear the sonics of it. You they really come that signature, like you're saying, the the sort of Sean Slade, a uh, Paul Coldry signature is on it, you know, where you hear like his, his love for like great guitar tones that are just in your face, you know, but drums that are like really polished where you hear the hi-hat and you hear the snare and you hear the kick and you really hear 
their placement in the field. And that's just what, what they're really good at. I, so I just sat and watched everything he did i was like wow <laughs> when we were working on records together when he was mixing our stuff and i would i would just email him questions like paul i really love the drum sound would you would you mind telling me what you did on it and i you know i won't share it with anyone i would really just love to know <laughs> really really great and he didn't he didn't care he was just like cool here's what i did and and I have all the emails from, from he and I where we were just like, you know, he's like, I'm using the Allen Smart as my bus compressor and I'm using, you know, the DBX 160 on the snare. He did all these great EQ things with the Tweed console and he would, he would document all that stuff for me. So I have all that stuff from, from our old, you know, Briggs records and stuff like that. So he was really, he was like really sweet and really nice and in, in sort of like giving me some of his insight, you know what I mean? And, wh and what his craft was and, and how he was getting his sounds. Cause I wanted to do it. I really was like, can I, can I just, can you tell me what you're doing? <laughs> One thing I want to want to ask you, you that was the Brown band, presumably with your brother. It was, it was my younger brother. He's two years younger than me. Ever since we were young, man, we were just, we were just doing band things together. I, I, I had managed to talk my dad into getting a drum set in the house. And when I was 12, I think, regrettably on his part, I'm sure. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I said to my brother, I said, you're going to learn to play the drums. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so I said, start figuring it out. He learned how to play the drums enough so that we could record some Beatles covers. And, uh, we would record little demos and things like that on my Porta Studio 4, the Tascam Porta Studio 4. We'd record the, the drums and guitar on track one. And then I'd do a bass overdub on track two. And then backing vocals on track three and lead vocals on four. That was like the, 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 the kernel of, of what became, you know, he and I just getting into all kinds of musical trouble basically in our teens I suppose in the back of my mind i'm thinking brothers growing up together playing in bands together and then you show up one day and go hey you know i want to go and do this uh, film and tv stuff like uh, yeah. what yeah he wasn't happy <laughs> it was starting to happen i think a little bit for him too because uh we wanted to we wanted to have families and and you know actually sure. at, the, at the end of our touring phase we were both married also so you know we were like away from our wives like nine months out of the year and it was like you know it was it was tough you know because we we wanted to have the family life too but we really we couldn't we couldn't do anything to further that because we were out on tour all the time so I kind of was the first person to instigate the conversation and say you know I think this is where I'm going to go I think I'm going to just just dive deep into the film and tv scoring world and see where it gets me and he said well okay i mean best of luck to you you know i mean he's he's always been very supportive obviously of what i do and uh, i don't think it was easy for him to to hear that but i think uh i think eventually he's he's gotten over it he's he's got a, he's got a great family of his own now too and i think he's pretty happy to be uh, a father at home you're back in it what was what was the first kind of break what what actually kind of made you feel like okay it's usually working with a person it's not the money it's like something happens and i'm like oh this feels good something yeah. is clicking there was a lot of great little things that that came along but i think the first one where i really went okay yeah this is something was when um i got the gig uh, recording and mixing the score for a television show called Once Upon a Time or ABC, because that was that was or live orchestra every week for a, beautiful for a major television show, and you know I had done some orchestral recording, but really not that much, and and most of it was as an assistant and observing over other people's shoulders. So this was my f my first time recording a major orchestra every week uh, for you know for a major show you know, all in surround sound, like the whole thing, but it, but you know, like, like a film production, but for a TV show. And that was when, and, and then the show, you know, did really well and, and, and was, was successful and all that. But that was where I really kind of started to hone in my real serious orchestral production and, and engineering chops. Cause I was just week in week out trying different microphones, trying different preamps, trying different positions in the rooms and things like that. And, and we did that show for seven seasons. So there was a lot, I mean, 
I don't even know how many episodes that was. It was like 200 episodes or something like that. So oh, seven seasons. So it went into syndication. Yeah. Yeah. It's a That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, for people that are watching and don't understand with composers and uh, in particular, the hope is that your show goes into syndication, meaning it's playing continuously. And that's a, a wonderful revenue stream because there's actually quite a lot more work in many ways because of Netflix. I hear a lot of my friends saying there's more work than there ever was, but the, mm, how can I be delicate on this? The no. residual incomes, <laughs> I can't be delicate, can I? Um, the residual incomes have pretty much disappeared. So it's now more work for hire. Are you in that position? Do you feel like where you're able to pick and choose what kinds of work that you do now? To some degree, but, uh, you know, I have, I think a lot of what got me to where I am and my success was built on really just always saying yes and always being agreeable to almost any project. Because I think like when you, when you, and I've watched a lot of your shows too, and it's like, you hear this time and again from producers and engineers who talk about their beginning story where it's like, you're just saying yes to things. And when you're saying yeah. yes to things, you find yourself in the same room as Dr. Dre or in the same room, exactly. as, you know what I'm saying? Beyonce or whatever. And then yep. you end up becoming this person's, you know, uh, a personal engineer and these sort of things that if you hadn't just said yes uh, and just been enthusiastic to just be part of the process that you wouldn't have had whatever opportunity would have come up for you to, to suddenly hit that next step. So I don't, I don't see myself as well now that I have a certain level of success and that I have these things that, that I w could just say, you know, well, no, I don't want to do your small project or no, I don't really want to do is, you know, uh, something for, for just for free, if, unless the movie makes money or something like that and pro bono projects and stuff. I say yes to all of it. It, it. Certainly if I can, I will say yes to it. If I physically cannot do it because it's just, can't get done in the next 72 hours because I'm doing something else and then I, then I won't, but I try and even then I will try and have my assistant engineer do it or another engineer who I really trust and I'll, and I'll be part of it. Cause I just, I just want to always be appreciative of what I have. You know what I mean? And I think being, being six, a real true success is really appreciating what you have, whether it be, great projects, really high paying projects or not so. And that, you know, you might find yourself in a, in a period of time where you aren't getting a lot of calls and you, you know, there's guys who aren't calling you or somebody who you said no to for a small project who's now really successful and won't call you anymore because you said no in that, in that early stage of their career, you know, it happened several times where I, I said yes to somebody who was, I could see had a really promising career, had no money to something and I said yes absolutely let's do it because you're really talented I can see that and I know something's going to happen and it has you know so I'm always looking at the bright side of that and that anytime you're doing a project for you know maybe not that much money or you're doing it because you love it or something like that that you know there's always something to get from it there's always and there's always something to learn from it no matter what I think you're speaking to a couple of really big points there. First of all, having a massive Rolodex is huge. You know, actually having worked with hundreds of people increased is, is logical. I don't think anybody can deny how logical that is. I think about things that have been successful for me. Some of them were nine months work mm -hmm. and some of them were 20 minutes work. So you just, you don't know where it's going to come from. Oh. Andrew Wells, you know who Andrew Wells is? He's like uh, a young mid twenties producer and he's on fire and he's done great. And okay. I've used him as a couple of times as an example. I wonder if, cause I think your story is a little bit like this. He hired me to mix his band and he was 17 or maybe 16. And he asked if he could come down to the studio and like be there for the recalls. So he came down and he sat in the studio while we were, you know, doing the finishing touches on the thing. He barely said any, anything. He asked me a couple of questions. He really impressed me of his professionalism. And I really liked the guitar playing. Three months later, I get a phone call from uh, a, an old boss of mine at Capitol who says to me, putting a band together, the singer's only 16. We need a young band. Do you know any guitar players? I was like, yeah. 
this guy, Andrew Wells. Mm -hmm. It was great. He was totally professional. He was really respectful. He actually paid me and asked me questions as opposed to like sending me endless emails and, and being a pain in the butt in like, as though I owed him something. He actually treated me really professionally. And I said, this guy's a good player. He looks great. Fantastic. He got the gig. He went and auditioned. He got the gig. Then about a year goes by and I get another call and I get like, we need not only a guitar player, but we need a musical director, but he has to be young. And I was like, this kid. And it was just, it's, <laughs> it's like creating, he created the opportunities by really, by being really smart and really professional. And um, God, I can think of my first intern um, of note was Phil Allen. He interned for me at 18 years old. And he helped put on a festival that we were doing. And he got there at 7 a.m. and put up PA equipment. <laughs> and, was just, and I can flash forward 10 years and he's working at my other studio, Harmony. And we set up some mics and I leave him for the day. And he does a demo. And that demo was Adele and uh, Dan Wilson. And it was someone like you. And then Rick Rubin produces the whole track and the, yeah. and the British label reject it and said, we prefer the demo because of Adele's uh, passionately feeling about it. And then, you know, flash forward uh, a year later, he's on stage with a Grammy, you know? So that started from like building PAs at 18 years old at seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's you. The message I don't want to portray is the fact that they did these crappy gigs. They kept coming back because I have a lot of people that do those kind of things and I can hear people's minds going like, yeah, I've done that. It's like, yeah, but did you stick around for 10 years afterwards? Five years? Right. Did you just go, I've, I've done my, I did that, you know, or did you actually keep coming back and keep working at it and, and, and keep pushing up against things, you know? We have a lot of interns that come in and out uh, the studio here at Fab and, and, and some of them are, are really great and and really just are, are in it to win it. Doesn't matter what the task is. They're doing it with a smile on their face. They don't care what you're asking them to do, whether it be taking out the trash or something that might actually involve their skill level more. To guys who aren't necessarily doing that and they have a little bit of that, you know, you can't quite get their their attitude whether or not they're appreciative or or feel a little bit like uh you know you're offending them by asking them to you know clean the bathroom or something like that but it is exactly that attitude which is the sort of first step into well i'm not going to ask him to maybe assist with me on a day if i you know if suddenly i can't use an arm or something like that and he's the only guy there if he's got a bad attitude i'm not going to ask him i'm going to call somebody who i know you know uh, who's maybe 20, 30 minutes away, but who I know has a better attitude, I'm going to call in to, to, uh, to assist me and give them that opportunity. So if you don't have, if you just don't have that, exactly what you're saying is that sort of like, it's smile on your face. It just doesn't matter what you're being put through because everyone's been put through it. You know what I mean? You've been put through it. I've been put through it. So you don't need to tell us that you're going through it because we know you're going through it and you're going to go through it for a while. And this is part of, of what it takes to get to, to the, to the level you want to get to is you have to, you have to endure everybody's, you know, everybody's things that, that they need help with. You know what I mean? You're here to help us. You know, we're not here to help you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I remember in one of your, uh, in one of your uh, shows you had talked about, you know, one of the roles of a producer being, you know, the sort of psychologist, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, the last thing you need is an assistant or somebody who's working for you to need you to, you know, consult them on, on how they're feeling, you know what I mean? And something that, that, that they should be really good at is actually making you feel better so that you can get your job done quicker. You know what I mean? So I, I totally agree. Yeah. The attitude is a big part of it. Yeah. It's a huge, it's a huge part of it. Um, but it's it, it's tough. My attitude is I feel like a, being a Gen Xer and being sort of stuck in between the war of the the baby boomers and and uh, the millennials that's sort of going on has been going on for a good 10, 15 years now. I feel like one of the things we have to remember, especially for me coming up when everything was everything was tape and it was the birth of early digital, the barrier to entry actually forced them to be those people. And I think that's something we have to understand. I think we have to have a little bit of compassion and we have to sit down with them. And Because for, for me, I, 
you know, I've made my first al a album. You know, I walked into a studio and I saw, I think it was a Neve console on the first one I ever did. I didn't even know what a Neve console was in those days. I looked around, there was a tape machine and there was like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. And that's the barrier to entry was absolutely massive. It was, I had the same thing as you. I had four track cassettes. I eventually got to ADATS. Woohoo. And then the real studio was just like the, it was untouchable. Yeah. So when you're up and coming, in those days, you had so much to learn, and it actually allowed that age group to develop. Yeah. Now, I think for kids, one of the problems that we have to, as 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 their as their bosses and their mentors, is understand that there is no barrier to entry anymore. It's five hundred dollars worth of gear, and they can actually effectively sonically get the same results as us. It's a, always a a balancing thing, isn't it? Do you, how do you find, are you mentoring by osmosis? Are you literally showing them you're, you're working, you're doing your job and, and they are, they're, they're learning by seeing how you work or do you find you are sometimes having to sort of sit them down for five minutes and go, Hey, this is what you need to improve upon. It's a little bit of both. I mean, we have, we have guys who have really a, a strong interest in what I do who asked to come into the studio and, and I'll let them just come in and, and watch what I'm doing. And then there's, um, you know, my, my assistant who works with me on a daily basis learns a lot of things through osmosis through just seeing my sessions, seeing how they're built, seeing the way my final sessions look because he's cleaning them up and printing. So he sees how I get to my, my end result. And he's learning that way. And then some of it is, is showing him by hand of, of just like, listen, the easiest way to show you this is just have you sit here in my seat and I'm just going to tell you what to do because otherwise you're not, you have to think like me. And that's, that's the thing is everybody's different, right? So like working for you or working for Dave Pensado or working for, you know, Chris Vogel or Alan Meyerson or me or whoever is is all a different mindset and so you know you can know every every key command in pro tools but the person's workflow is is always personal so getting to understand somebody's personal workflow is is really important because that's where a lot of their work and effort is going into like building the easiest way and most creative way to get your end results as fast as possible. That I think has to be done in person. I think you have to just, I just will sit, you know, Mick down or whoever, and I'll just say, listen, just sit down. Let's do this session together, you and me, because I want you to see what I want from a track by track basis, all the way from the bottom to the top, and we'll just do it. And um, I think once he gets it, and and once, once a, an intern or an assistant gets it, then a lot of it can just be done through you know, I just send him something and just say, do this. And then he just knows what I want, you know? So sometimes I actually have guys come in and videotape me and we'll just do a, a, a 20 minute video of me going through setting up a mix or going through printing a mix or going through how to get uh, an orchestral sound. And so we have these different videos so that they can do it for me um, on, uh, you know, on an assistant basis, if I need set up on sessions, they can just refer to the video and, and do it from there. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I, haven't heard, I haven't heard anybody else talk about it in those terms. Maybe other people are doing that, but that is, that's super smart. Uh, to me, it feels like for people coming up now, it's like a convergence, isn't it? Because you need the skill set, but nobody is going to take a movie budget like, so here we have a $25 million dollar, budget movie that's coming out on September the 1st and mm. nobody is going to hire somebody into that scenario with a massive risk. It sounds like, uh, you know, you've got guys coming up and the way that you came up is you have to prove that you're one of those people that can be relied upon. And the only way to get that experience is to work for guys like you. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to make mistakes then, and you know that. And so putting somebody in a position where they're going to make mistakes and that those consequences are going to be not going to be super dire and uh, uh, sure. horrible. That's, uh, that's where you want them to learn. You know, you want them to learn right. mistakes without terrible consequences. And so you have them do them as interns and as assistants and, and on, on levels that, that are, you know, okay, so you made a mistake. Good. So now, you know, it's like, you don't, you don't, 
you don't put a track, uh, an audio file on a track and then not assign it through one of my buses because then when I go to print it, it's not printing the audio. When I go to deliver that to the mastering engineer, it's printing without that instrument in it. But I heard it out of my speakers, but it wasn't going through the bus. Well, how would you learn that mistake? You'd have to make the mistake to know that that's a mistake. I've made the mistake of, and I've had it happen and it's, it's cost me a lot of money. Uh, but I want to avoid that from having, you know, I don't want an assistant to have to have that same experience of like, okay, well, you know, you don't want to be stressed out with these mistakes. You'd like to learn them and go, cool, we'll slap on the wrist and we'll, we'll move on. So I give them, I give them sessions to set up and, and if they're wrong like that, I'll point them out. I'll say, you know, you need to, you need to make sure you really look at that and, and, and don't mess these things up because these are important and this is why they're important. You know, you really have to put the sort of significance of how important some of these things are that if you do screw something like that up, it's going to cost money and reputation for people. Having the opportunity to make the mistakes in an environment where it can be safe to some degree is crucial to the runway of becoming you know, a proper engineer and producer is like giving yourself some time to do that. And if an assistant goes long enough not making mistakes, I'm like, cool, you should start mixing some stuff. You know? Let me give you a couple of things to mix that flush this out for me, you know, do that or whatever. And it's like, that's when you start to... Uh, at least for me, that's when I give somebody the sort of the next level is like, if I know there's, we've really kind of like fully scrubbed that one clean in terms of no mistakes, let's, let's give you the next bit of difficulty, you know? What are you currently working on that you're allowed to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> working on a lot of things right now. One, one of the uh, really fun things I'm working on is a couple of games. Some of them I can't mention, but one I can is, uh, <laughs> video game called assassin's creed valhalla um oh nice yeah i know that <laughs> yeah and that one is uh really exciting and that is the composers are jesper kid and uh sarah uh, Schachner. they're writing killer music for it but but uh i'm mixing that for them working on uh, a new marvel film that's was actually going to come out this year but when, with the pandemic it got moved to next march but uh, that one is the new uh, Jared Leto uh, movie called Morbius. Where he's oh, wow. That sounds exciting. Playing Dr. Morbius. And that's going to happen probably in the next uh, month and a half or so when we're actually going to go into production on that. Yeah, like I said, I'm working on a couple of things I can't mention. I um, got to do this little thing with, with Hans and stuff and a couple other guys who are working on some interesting projects that they won't let me talk about, but they're very exciting. And uh they you will hear about them soon so the, i think just the, the morbius uh um the that, morbius, that's, that sounds very exciting yeah that's going to be really big it's going to be really great and of course assassin's creed valhalla is huge huge yeah yeah it's going to be and yeah. in fact they actually just uh released um a little uh ep for it uh last week and they're going to be releasing the soundtrack on double vinyl i think well thank you ever so much for for joining us um i think in this episode we we covered a lot i i, I love hearing the jo journey pardon me that thinks that this could almost be like from punk rock to you know to 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 film i mean it's totally. like yeah it's good. I, I I hadn't didn't know that about you and yeah. I knew the bricks. For yeah. some reason I wasn't really putting two and two together. Yeah. Why did I not figure that out? Yeah, it's a you know, it's it's my story. It's a weird one. I don't know what to say. Tell it's you. a cool one. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because for me it's like I don't talk much about it. For those of you who managed to get to the end of this video, because it's gonna be an hour hour long. But yeah, I, I, I was just talking to somebody else the other day about some punk rock stuff and i was like yeah i i, I mixed uh, joe strummer live dvd and i did the ramones live last live concert i mixed that and i did and i started talking about this stuff and they're like what and i was like oh yeah and i did the tribute console i recorded and mixed that as well you know with the chili peppers and this and i was like i grew up i grew up wanting to work with like iggy and the stooges and you yeah. know that to me is like it doesn't get any better than that thank you ever so much warren thank you very I much i really appreciate it Talk to you soon, man. Like I said, this is our over an hour interview. If you get get to this stage, we really appreciate it. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. And once again, Jason, thank you. And have a everybody have a marvelous time. Have a good weekend. Have a good week. See everybody. <laughs> <laughs>